Hey, welcome to Labor Goes to the Movies with me, Chris Garlock, director of the DC Labor Film Fest, and my sister in cinematic solidarity, Elise Bryant, executive director of the Labor Heritage Foundation. Our guests this week are Andrea Arenas, communications and policy coordinator for the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement and co-host of the El Desvio podcast. She'll be doing the Q&A for Identifying Features in Señas Particulares on Wednesday, March 31st. We're also joined by labor journalist Sarah Yaffe, author of the great new book, Work Won't Love You Back, How Devotion to Our Jobs Keeps Us Exploited, Exhausted, and Alone. Sarah also co-hosts the Terrific Belabored podcast. I think you'll really enjoy our discussion with Andrea and Sarah. We talk about our first movies, about the things we're missing from being stuck watching movies at home during the pandemic. And we even have some tips on how to watch scary movies. So grab your popcorn, sit back and relax, and enjoy the show. Andrea, welcome to Labor Goes to the Movies. Really appreciate you uh, spending a little of your Friday morning with us. Oh, it's, it's great. It's great. We wanted to have you on, of course, because uh, you're doing the Q&A for one of our, one of our films um, in our Labor Film Fest Spring Series. But honestly, this, this podcast is, is really uh, much, very, very informal. Great, great. How do you informal in Spanish? Informal? Yep. Sí, sí. Muy informal. <laughs> morning. Oh, Sarah, morning. you really did. Good morning. <laughs> hey, you you got to tell me if I've got to do video, you know, because I, I don't know. look like this most days. Yes, you do. Put on makeup you wake up looking like to. that, don't you? According to all the movies I see, you all wake up looking just like that, right? <laughs> right. Cheers. <laughs> well, thank you, Sarah, for joining us. And it, I was just telling Andrea, this is a very informal podcast. This is, Elise and I were, were talking, she was getting her tea while we were getting ready and was like, okay, that's the way this podcast is. We just hang out, we get our tea, and then we, we talk about movies. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get my coffee. While get we your do. coffee, tea, whatever it is that you're drinking at nine o'clock in the morning on a Friday. We're, we're not judgmental here. Mm -mm. TGIF. Maybe I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Code for something. So we wanted you both to be on because you're both doing Q and A's in the Labor Film Fest series. Um, and we'll probably talk a little bit about the movies that we're, you're going to do, but this we're more interested in your relationship with movies and, and, and actually, you know, TV too, if you're into that. There's just, these platforms are always are getting very confusing anymore. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what you're watching, where you're watching. So we usually start out by asking folks about like what your, uh, at least share your, your movie experience to sort of give a, give a flavor, your, your first movie memory. Oh, my first movie memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we had a little local theater. It was called The Flick, right? And we, I didn't even know it was you know, short for flicker or flick movie. But anyway, we went to the flick and I was paired with my parents. And I'm, I'm, I always guess I'm about five years old, or six years old. I remember being quite short to my father's hand. And we walked in and, you know, in the darkness and then the screen lit up and it was like, oh, whoa, daddy, look at the big TV. <laughs> and it was just huge. And the movie was Prince Valiant and it was in Technicolor. And it was the colors were so bright and the horses were just huge and the, the blue of Prince Valiant's cape was just awesome. And I was just like, this is true magic. And I, I feel that big when I go to the movie theater now, although I haven't been in, in over a year. So who knows what it'll be like when I go back. But it's yeah, true. that was my first experience of movies and movie theaters. But when, when, Elise, when Elise and I go to the movies together, she's just like, I think, and, and I know that story. She, I think that little girl comes back out because she, she's, she's also, she's like me. She doesn't like to talk in the movies. So. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> no. Hush. We can talk all through the credits. I mean, the, the 
commercials and yeah, yeah. trailers and all that stuff. But once the movie starts, it's nay, no nay on the talk K. But there's just people who will just talk. Oh my God. Oh, come on. You don't have, you don't both have friends? My mom, there's this, there's this very scary movie. I forget it, the in, in Cuba's, I don't know. It's got a really weird name and it's mm -hmm. scary. Were you going to say something, Tara? No, a name? Uh, well, it freaks me out, this movie. But if I watch it with my mom, I'm never scared. I, I'm just, I just can't. I don't have the time, right? Oh. She's like, oh my God, she's going to go into the kitchen. She's going to do it. She's going to, look at her shoes. Uh, what do you think she, those shoes. <laughs> Thank you, mom. <laughs> you need to send my, your mom to my house because I can't watch scary movies. Maybe with your mom. Can't watch scary movies. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Nothing scary with her. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> Yeah, my mother watching movies with my mother is like, what's gonna happen? Tell me what's, and I'm like, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Why is it? Why is he doing that? I don't know. I didn't write the movie. I wish I wrote the movie, I'd make more money. <laughs> <laughs> now I do, I do like to watch a scary movie with a largely African-American audience. Oh yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh, that, cause that's don't go in the closet, do but, that. What? <laughs> <laughs> King Kong, this is my favorite. King Kong, he got a death complex. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, death wish. He got a death wish. I was like, really? You think King Kong's got a death wish? That's why he's climbing on top of the building. It's great. It's like the the audience was silent when it's when it came out. It was just like everybody cracked up. I was just hysterical. I love it. saying um we grew up in rochester new york and there was a the old, the old capitol theater which is an old movie palace one of the last movie palace. i think it's gone now i'm sure it's gone now but it was uh it was across the street in uh, main street rochester and all black audience because it was black downtown at that point and i saw halloween there <laughs> which uh, which is not a scary movie if you see it with a black audience <laughs> no <laughs> Somebody's gonna write to us and say we're like making stereotypes of like, no, you haven't seen a movie with a largely black audience. <laughs> Too bad. You no, know, it's great. It's great. It really is. <laughs> so, so, Andrea, do you have a, a memory of like your first film or a, a film that was really influential when you were from growing up? So, when you just asked Elise, I started thinking, what was the first movie I ever went to the theater for? To the movies. I'm pretty sure it was Rocky. Oh wow! Which one? Four. Wow! You got it. Wow! In Colombia, and then I, I just remember that he died. He dies, right? Is it in four or five? Or I stopped died? watching around two or three. You know, he, he gets like a, something, and and he's sick, right? Because he got too many punches to the head, and and my brother and I were just like on the floor of the theater, like. <laughs> <laughs> we just didn't want him to die <laughs> well good for you he does he makes like 10 more i think right <laughs> yeah he's still there sarah what about you so i'm racking my brain now and i don't remember what the first movie i saw in the theater was isn't that crazy it wasn't i mean i guess it was pretty long ago but like 
Um, yeah, I, I don't remember. Or, one. or another way to ask it is, is something that, and another one of my stories is I saw Star Wars when it came out, but I, I didn't know, I just went with some friends. They just took me and, and I had no idea what was happening. And when, you know that first thing when the, when the spaceship comes over and I was sort of like Elise, I was like, oh my God. I mean, it was just, it was, so that was, that's like a really seminal memory for me. So, I mean, do you have a movie like that that really just sort of had a big effect on you? I remember, so this is really funny. I remember walking out of Ghostbusters 2 because I was terrified, um, which is ridiculous because it's a Ghostbusters movie. Like you watch that now and you're like, I was scared of what now? I was scared <laughs> of the painting apparently. I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I, I remember like being like terrified and like my sister and I were there with like our babysitter had taken us and, and we were just like, I need to go. I, no, not, no, out, I'm out. And I, how old was I? I must have been, what year did that movie come out? I don't even remember. Like, look at this. I, I love movies and I almost went to film school and I can't remember the first movie I saw in the theater. How depressing is that? So you like wouldn't even get in. That's one of the questions they asked, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Friday morning. I've had a long week. Um, they're trying to kill my industry again, which is like a biweekly occurrence. But, you know, they laid off half the Huffington Post staff and the New Republic is being rejiggered again. And I just, you know, it's, it's hard actually to think about anything else when your jobs are dying. I hear you, sister. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. But actually, that sort of sets up another question, which is when you have, I mean, for me, I mean, we're all activists, right? And so we all have, uh, unfortunately, a lot of weeks like that, <laughs> uh, some worse than others. Is there something that you turn to in those times? Because I, I, I turn to movies because movies are a way for me to, to fool myself into feeling like I'm engaged but I'm, it's not completely, it's not like I'm watching documentaries, right? But that, that's sort of my therapy. That's what I turn to. It's, does that work for you at all? Or Yeah, I mean, I thought about watching Nomadland last night, which I've like talked myself out of several times because I would both. just think like, oh, that person sold her labor story and it turned it into an award-winning movie. Maybe that's what I should do. Great, put more pressure on yourself, Sarah. <laughs> So it doesn't exactly work that way. <laughs> it just looks like another thing. It's like, uh, I need to go for a walk and like leave my phone at home is what I really need to do. Um, that way the depressing news can't keep up. Mm, yeah. It'll just be there when you get back. Yeah. 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 I, I was so desperate last year to, to, to find something that was just total brain candy. Yeah. That I watched Jangle. <laughs> How was that? Wait, 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 wait. Now, which now? Jangle. Jangle, not Django. Not Django, Jangle. Okay, because that's not brain candy. I don't know what it is, but it's not brain candy. No, that's not, no Django is something else. No, that's, mm, that's, that's hard there. That's terrible. No, Django, it, um, it had Forrest Whitaker and uh, Key of Key and Peele. Uh, Michael Keenan, what? Hey. Michael Keenan, Michael Key. Yeah. Uh, with the stars, and it was this like you know fantasy Christmas movie. Hence the name Jangle, isn't Jingle Jangle? Maybe it's called Jingle Jangle. Anyway, anyway <laughs> I go on, but it, it was total brain candy, total brain candy. It was like it had these fantastic colors and fantastic costumes. That was like uh, Black Panther goes Christmas, right? And and this uh, interracial cast. It was this totally made up place in the world, and. Uh, and Forrest Whitaker was just fantastic as a sort of mad scientist, good guy who trains uh, Key to in his trade, and Key takes it over and turns it into a capitalist adventure, and you know, and just totally wrecks the whole thing. And then they get it back, of course. And the little girl is the is the Shiro, and she's just smart and bright, and she's got her little uh, guy friend who you know is a big you know blurred you know black nerd, and the two of them solve the whole thing, and it's oh, it's just it's. It's just ridiculously fun. And no, you know, no, nothing in between, but delightful. Very but I feel that during these, you know, the, the, the last few, the last year, honestly, if, at least for me, when I'm looking for a movie, I feel like something, at the end of the day, something light, something easy. Mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. light. I watched mm -hmm. two days ago uh, for the very first time, King. Arthur, King Arthur, King Arthur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
comedy of this American who suddenly becomes the next in line for the throne. Oh, and oh, it's, right, right. it's mm-hmm. super funny. It's silly. <laughs> But it was great. Huh? Um, but that's, uh, it, yeah, it, 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 it is really helpful. And then even when it's some serious um, topics, it's also, it's, a, it's, a, it's another chance to see it in another way and, and many things that we're still living, but it, definitely a very nice break. I'm wondering what it's going to be like when we get back into the, into the movie theater. It's going to be amazing. Oh, like, interesting. It's, well, that's, and that's one of the things, too, is that we're watching, you know, I, I watch a lot of films. For the film festival, I have to watch a lot of films. I've been doing it for years and, you know, watch them on your TV. And one of the things that I have to do, you know, this big difference is you're watching it on a smaller screen, but you're also watching it alone, which is so, so different than watching it with an audience. And, it, you know, it's it's normally I didn't mind it because, you know, I also go to the movies every week. Right. And now I haven't gone to the movies for a year and, and the most might be, you know, Lisa might be sitting there laughing next to me. And that's not the same as a, as an audience. And, and at least I know for you, I mean, you're a theater person. I mean, you're, you, you thrive on human connection. It's, it's, Plus I'm an it's, extrovert. <laughs> yeah. So more energy from people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's really, it's really remarkable. I mean, I, I theater is my first love. I mean, movies are the backup. Uh, so yeah, being with other folks, even if they're talking, <laughs> it gives, gives energy. Um, but it's been, you know, it's been an interesting transition doing this uh, stay-at-home thing. And I, I remember like the first time I saw a concert was a People's Music <coughs> Network concert on my TV. I'd plug the iPad into the TV so I had the big screen. And, you know, I got my tea out, my little muffy slippers, and I sat down and was like, Wow, this is kind of cool. No parking, no parking payments, no, you know. Traffic. <laughs> so yeah. And so but I, I I'm I'm jonesing for that uh community experience of being being in the theater. The movies the plays. And Sarah, I was thinking about you because of course you got your new book out, which you know, well played, it's right behind you. Good job. <laughs> uh, but you know, normally you would be doing, you know, a book tour, which has its own, you know, the travel and the hotels and you know, is are, are enough people gonna turn up or have enough people gonna buy your book? That's gonna be a completely different experience, right? Yeah, you have all the anxiety and none of the fun. <laughs> um, everything. I mean, the reason the book is there is because this is what I do all day, every day right now is sit at this desk and talk to people about the book and I don't go anywhere and I live alone. And so it's like, you turn off the zoom and then you're just like, yep, still alone, still alone. Um, yeah. And so it's like, the, the, like, I'm trying to figure out like rituals to sort of come down from like performing into the void you know like at least when you even if you have a half full audience at like a speaking gig at least there are humans in the room right and not Mm -hmm. like numbers on a zoom call and it's sort of like watching a movie by yourself versus what watching a movie with an audience you're just like oh there are people in the world who care about things um and right now it's really cut off and it's just really strange like the sort of passive encounters with people that we're just not having now, right? Like, you know, the conversation you might have like in the ladies room after the movie, right? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really Mm -hmm. missing women's bathroom conversations. (laughs) Women's bathroom conversations are the best. You know, you're just like, oh my God, I love your shoes. I love your hair. And you're best friends in five minutes and like, Wait a minute, wait a minute, really? Because this does not happen in the men's bathroom. We do not not speak. Um, no, stalls, no. Uh, and you do your business in the stall and then you talk uh, about the thing. Okay. I don't understand why men don't have stalls, but this is a conversation for a different point. We have them, <laughs> but this is a thing I have never understood about men's bathrooms. We why have them, it? we have them, but we're, you know, it's in and out. And and I tell you what, if you try talking to somebody in a stall, the cops would be there so fast to make your head spin. <laughs> but, but what Sarah's saying is absolutely true especially like happy hour bathrooms, you know, Mm -hmm. and then after a while you're like, hey, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, yeah, you do become friends. And it's happened to me too, even like 
I spoke German once in a bathroom in Germany just, just because, you know, I, I made up the word. I made up the, I didn't know how to say bathroom. I invented it, Pipish Hagen, and I ended up in a, but you do become friends with people. And, and, and yeah, and, and that's missing. And what you were saying, Elise, um, just the, when there are people in an audience, different audiences uh, respond different ways, right? So for example, where the, say, Sarah, you're talking to an audience and suddenly today, Friday, everybody's clappy and, and happy and interactive. And then on Monday, you're speaking about the same topic to another audience and nobody wants to yeah. anything, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Even those little differences that, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they are. So we, I was watching, we were watching a, um, uh, Ashford and Simpson concert and I go into the women's bathroom and somebody starts going, you're all I need to get by. You're all I need to get by. You're all I need. And pretty, and pretty soon the whole line, we're waiting in line. You're all I need to get by. That's women's bathroom. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I, I am so missing out here. I want to, I want to ask, I want to ask Andrea um, about uh, Latino audiences. I mean, are, are, uh, at movies. As long as we're talking about stereotypes, but but seriously, I mean, are are they are they different? I mean, uh, do they react differently? I would say that we're more on the on the African American side of commenting, being loud, uh, being uh, maybe maybe if there might be one group of people that can win us in being the happy and you know explosively happy i think that maybe yeah african americans can be more like more happy than we can sometimes so maybe if we got both together it would be like an explosion of fun at the movies because <laughs> fun loud. at the movies oh, yeah. yeah that would be yeah. loud <laughs> well, would I, i'm sorry <laughs> well no one of the things that i was thinking about just thinking about my experiences is is that it's with those audiences, both Latino and, and, and African-American, that it's really more communal. I was just kind of thinking about what Sarah was talking about, that in, in, in a lot of way, when I go to movies, I'm there, I'm there for the movie. I really want to focus on the movie. You know, I'm, I'm really you know serious about it. Um, but I'm just thinking back to when I've been in other countries and it's like everybody's out. It's like one big living room, right? And so it's people are not individual. It's not that, you know, and so you like, it, it, I don't know, is, is that, does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that that you are in a room with the rest of the people watching and, and, and you will hear, I know, I Dios, you know, <laughs> and that's something you, you get a lot, right? And in Latin America is and here it doesn't happen a lot. Like you hear people go in and they're quiet, right? And Latin America is silencio, silencio, cabeza. You know, when somebody's too tall to sit in the back and we will, yeah, we won't go to the third person, the person who manages the the, the cinema to, to, you know, we just handle it ourselves because we're loud and we're, but, but I think that in that context to today, for example, uh, if we even relate it to sports, you know, and when we as humans are in one place, the enormous difference it, it makes. And I, I, I can compare it to maybe soccer games mm -hmm. that they're empty now. But even when we go to, when we used to go to soccer games, you know, there's going to be the, the ones who are for this team are going to be on one side, on the other team are going to be on the other side. And that's not, you know, planned. It's just the way, oh, I'm going to go here where my people are and I'm going to go to this one. And it is a, it, it is there is communication throughout the game throughout our reactions right and we don't have that um currently and yeah i'm, I'm really looking forward to that vaccine because i miss it <laughs> well i think on the academic tip I, since we've been talking I, i've developed a theory here uh, and that is i know in the african-american community call and response is uh is, is a cultural norm the preacher says something and the church says amen you know, sometimes they call for it. But the, and you go to a black church on Sunday and you go to a white church on Sunday, you got two different experiences. I mean, we're singing, we're shouting amen, we're going back and forth, the choir singing. Uh, the difference between watching the uh, documentary on Aretha Franklin's concert that she gave when she recorded the Amazing Grace concert, you know, seeing it, seeing it by myself was one thing. I went to the, the theater and saw it with a largely African American And people were just, it was church in the theater. 
I mean, and I just felt it. So I had seen it before and I felt it totally different being in the audience and having that call and response. And um, I, in, engaging in that was just, you know, I think really it's not just, uh, it's just uh, not just movies. It is that, that call and response. That's so funny. I was talking to a friend in the UK the other day about sort of why, the, the, you know, the, the sort of political obsessions that go both ways. Mm -hmm. But he was saying that like, you know, well, American, Americans have this like rhetorical tradition that doesn't translate to like, you know, nice white guys like Jeremy Corbyn. And that just led me to like digging up a video of Nina <laughs> Turner giving a talk at the People's Summit in, in uh, 2017, where she just like, she's talking on the stage and then she just hops off the stage, starts walking through the crowd, pulling people up and making them talk with her and like this whole thing. And it was such an amazing, amazing moment. And I was just like, yeah, that is absolutely true that like, nice sort of white Anglo-Saxon men standing at the podium just don't have that energy at all. And um, yeah, we should we should uh, think about that, what that gives like more, uh, what it should give to the left and, and labor, honestly, right? Is, is uh, taking advantage of these like incredible, I think Cori Bush is the same way, right? Cori Bush also has a background in preaching and like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're just incredible, incredible dynamic speakers, and that comes from all of the same tradition, right? Yes. Sarah, I was just, I was just uh, thinking, uh, and 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 Lise can help me out. Uh, the Lily Tomlin special, where she talks, where she's talking about the alien that goes to, I think it is, it, I, I can't remember, if it's a movie or the theater. Maybe it's the theater, and and they come out afterwards, and she's talking about how wonderful it was. But it turns out that the alien was watching the audience, <laughs> right? That, that they didn't realize what they were supposed to do and they're watching the audience and they were just watching all the people. And I, I have that experience because as a, as a programmer, I've always seen the film in the film fest. I often will actually watch people. And, and, and my favorite part is actually standing at the door at the end of the movie, because I'm sorry, Sarah, I was thinking about you, you know, during a normal book tour, I mean, it's a part where you get up and you talk and there's a Q&A, but my favorite part is always the conversations afterwards when the individual people come up and talk. And that's my favorite part of the film festival is when individual people stop to talk, they hated the movie, they loved the movie, what happened here, what was really going, those individual things, rather than the formal Q&As, which tend, at least in the film festival, they tend to be I was sort of reacting to what you were talking about, Sarah, but you know, when you're standing up there and there's a Q and A, so it's a, by the time somebody formulates a formal question and then you have to have a formal answer as opposed mm -hmm. to if there, it's just a, you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I guess is what I was thinking. It's, it's just more, I've never really thought about maybe trying to mix those two things up. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, I just think we're, we're like, I don't know, I'm, like I said, I'm living alone. I feel like my social skills are atrophying over the last <laughs> few months because it's just like none of those little normal interactions and it's all this formal thing, right? Because like we, it's so hard, like you can't have a Zoom call with like five people without some sort of structure of like, okay, now you speak and you mute speaking and like, it's just impossible to actually um, have spontaneous conversations essentially true it's true you guys have done some of those everybody's done these family things right and i uh i i i i felt i felt this most with those family gatherings right we did it for my dad's birthday we did it for my birthday and i had a friend who did it for his mother's i don't know 90th and he organized it he, he had it really well organized okay like sarah now you're gonna speak now andre you're gonna speak and it was very well organized but it was completely bloodless right it just like if you tried to do that i don't know about it in your families but in my family if i tried to get people to speak like, <laughs> there would be a rebellion <laughs> uh, no my, my family we're not on zoom oh yeah like a zoom ban is there like a is there... <laughs> now it's just like uh, no <laughs> like you know you can have fun we could like really get yeah <laughs> so so why the, it, it, er, I think I think it's age actually. I think it's because my sisters uh, are older than me and they're retired, and so they're just like they're not zooming every day. They're not they're not on Zoom. Zoom are us, 
trail. And I, so my older sister's done it with her kids, but my other sisters have not done it at all. So they're not even remotely interested. Huh. And even, even Cindy, who is an extrovert like me, my older sister, I tried to get her to join our karaoke group. And she was like, really? How's that going to work? I said, you play the song, you sing it, you know, with the words in the screen. Oh, nope. Mm -mm. Huh. But that's just because it's virtual or just uh, even when it was face to face? Oh, no, if it was face to face. Oh, no, no, no. There'd be a big partying going on. It'd be, yeah. No, it's, it's Zoom. They're just not into the technology. Well, it is, it's a little bit weird. I haven't gotten myself around doing the workout via Zoom or work at, a, at all, honestly, but, but, and I feel bad about that, but, but, but yeah, like Zooming, uh, yoga, I, I, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like yeah. I'd like to be in the room and I understand right now we can't and the whole thing, but until we can, really, do I want to do that here? I'd if I'm gonna look ridiculous, I might as well look ridiculous in front of a lot of people and we can all laugh about it as opposed to here at home. My kids don't appreciate that very much, my ridiculousness in yoga very much so. But yeah, I think that um, that it's gonna be interesting uh, when we get back. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention though, when, when we, we started speaking about the, the movies and a and, and long time ago in Bolivia until until right before I moved here, which is like 15 years, I want to say, the movie theaters were still like the old chairs that the little ones and, and, and up until I was like 15, I remember that you could just walk in and, 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 and choose obviously wherever you wanted to sit and you could even smoke. You can, li you can light up your cigarette mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and no, and, you chose where to sit on this, like uh, the, the person would had this card and thing and, and just rolled a paper that had the number of the seat and they would give you that. <laughs> it was great. I missed that. There's, there's, that's gone. That's mm -hmm. gone. But I have seen that if you look on, on Marketplace on Facebook, you can buy old um, cinema chairs. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so here's the thing. I love. I'm with you. I I love going to those. And there are some of those. You go out into the hinterlands. There are still some of the old theaters with the old seats. Uh, and and I'm, I have real problems with the the sort of the move to turn the movie theaters into into actual living rooms with the easy chairs and the cup holders and the, I, I, I I'm not I'm not Serving down with food. that. Serving food. Yeah, serving. I don't know. But that said, those old seats are uncomfortable as hell. Seriously, seriously. And I mean, now, you know, because I also spend way too much time sitting there. Most people, they go there for one movie and they leave. And I'm, you know, watching way too many movies. So maybe, maybe it's my fault. But maybe. <laughs> so I want to go back to the question and answer thing. And I wonder if this, um, you, Sarah, guess maybe Andrea, if you experienced this. I, I prefer to have questions, if there's a panel discussion, for instance, I'd rather have the questions written down and submitted because when you open up the question and answer, I, I haven't noticed this so much on Zoom, that's true, but anyway, that you get up, people stand up and pontificate. They don't have a question. No. They just wanna, they just wanna go on about whatever their, their topic is. Um, and so when you talk about people coming up to you individually uh, after after a film or a book talk, it is different. I mean, it's you know they're they're expressing their opinion or they're asking the question because they really want to know, as opposed to let me just uh, raise this question for you. So I <laughs> is the spotlight on me? Can I stay here a little longer? And I just wondered if you experienced that. <laughs> oh yes, um, and you try, you know, when you're moderating an in-person event, you try to like gauge by like how quickly people put their hands up if they actually have a question or if they just like walked in with a speech. If they're shuffling papers around, you know they prepared at the speech. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's the worst. And so, yeah, that, that that is like one thing about Zoom calls is you can get people to like type their question in the question and answer box. And then you have to like, um, at least sort of, you know, have a question or we could just ignore it. Um, so I guess that's good, yeah. I think I, I have not in the long number of things that I've said that I miss in the last year said like, I miss being yelled at by somebody. <laughs> I mean, my favorite honestly was like <laughs> this one, this talk that I gave a few years ago, which I was like, I was sort of 
testing out some of the ideas that went into this book. And this guy in the back row, and I'm sorry, Chris, it was an older white guy, right. um, is just like shifting around in his seat as I'm talking and finally like makes a noise and then like says something. And I just sort of stop. And I'm just like, do you have something to say? And he's like, oh, I was just disagreeing with you. And I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna finish now. And then you can disagree with me. Uh, because it just like, it's so friggin' rude. And then like at the end, his disagreement was like, well, I like my job, so you must be wrong. And I was like, really? You like your job? Okay, well, I've been reporting on this subject for years. So I'm gonna continue talking now. I'm real happy that you have some feelings, sir. I'm real happy that you have been taught by everything in your society that your feelings are so important that you get to interrupt whatever anyone else is doing in order to express your vague disagreement that you have no reason for. <laughs> Sounds like a toddler. Uh, yeah. <laughs> been there. <laughs> and you're just like, no, actually. The fun thing about being at the front of the room is I don't have to care about your feelings. <laughs> yeah. That was probably an unusual uh in fact, I'm wondering how he did. He go to the like the wrong room somehow. Did he was, was no he misinformed? Idea. No <laughs> idea. Just, just sent him to like, the ladies' bathroom. Maybe we'll have a nice conversation there. <laughs> <laughs> See if he just wound up in the bathroom. Yeah, See if men just talk to each other in the bathrooms, this wouldn't happen. I'm gonna start it. I'm I'm, I'm telling you when I when I call start you from jail. People. When I call you from jail, you'll know what happened. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can have a whole discussion about you know WMP. <laughs> oh my goodness they're totally derailed talking about movies but talking about movies and, <laughs> and Go ahead. Things, I, I was kind of like re-watched the other day some like parts of um the uh, modern times oh yeah oh, wow happens. yeah and 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 i i realized that that's how i felt like if i could if I, if I act right now, how do you feel after a year? And how do you feel with like life nowadays? I said, <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's deep. That's it. That, that's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's eating us. And it, I, I imagine that if, if we were to do that movie nowadays, maybe it would be, you know, like the, uh, Charles, the new Charles Chaplin, instead of going down the whole mechanism and, you know, it would be maybe inside of, a phone uh, with the emojis, like that Disney picture, I think it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we're just so immersed in everything that it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe well, it's not, maybe it's not too late for Sarah to switch back to filmmaking and make that, make the, 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 the modern, modern times, Sarah, what do you think? I can be your Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Oh, now I'm going to have to go watch that. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. There, there's a reason it's a classic. But like the current one would be working in an Amazon warehouse, right? That's like exactly. chasing little robots around with the packages and and yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then yeah, in the, like, when was the last time we saw anything like that where they were like, here's a movie where like we're on the shop floor. Right. But I was gonna say, and then the part where, where you know, where, where they start protesting, now it would be like this virtual thing. Okay, you know what I mean? Zoom, there's a Zoom, and then, and you know, your little flat, everything, but everything has changed, but the, the technology has changed. Our yeah. circumstances are more like the same, you know, we're still stuck there. Absolutely. I was just because I was just, and, and Sarah, you would know this really well, but. This thing where the Amazon, where they, where they're monitoring all their workers, you're supposed to make a certain number of moves per minute or something, and and I, so so yeah, Andrea is completely correct. I mean that 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 film's all about automation, with, but but in terms mm -hmm. of industrial stuff and all of these these jobs that all of these you know older white men are really sad about losing, I don't think it's because. You know, <laughs> The jobs were so fucking wonderful. Yeah, it's just they paid well because they were a union, and now you've got Amazon, which is tracking your, you know, it's just Taylorism all it's to to the nth degree, right? Yeah, and they have like little gadgets on your arm, so now you have like a weird little robot scanner gadget, but it tracks everywhere you go and everything you do, and 
yeah, it's just like, oh, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, now, now I need, we need a movie in an Amazon warehouse is the thing. Is the thing well, you know, and I, I've heard this, I, at least I read this really, is that they have started some 12 step groups for workaholism. <gasps> Way. Yes, 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 yes. Because I mean, how, you, so this is funny. I, I was doing an event with Dave Zirin the other day and he sent me this article from 1981 about workaholism. And it was so funny because like all of the things it described as like a problem in 1981 are just like what they expect you to say about yourself when you take, get a job interview in, in 2021, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that, oh, I just work all the time and work is my favorite thing and I love my job. And like this article was like, yeah, most people just work to get a paycheck and like, that's obvious. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we don't actually believe that anymore. And that's, it was so interesting to be like, whatever. Like, yeah, but how can you blame somebody for being a workaholic right now when like your boss expects that of you? Right. Where if you and work 40 hours, you're slacking. Right. And it's the only addiction that's rewarded in the workplace. You come in high, you come in drunk, you out, you know, but you come in and you say, I'm gonna, what? It's only been nine hours that I've been here. I'm gonna make another 12. I'll you haven't gone home yet? No, I've been here all night. You know, we're rewarded <laughs> for it. I mean, and not only rewarded, but like, you're punished if you don't. Uh -huh. You know, like, yeah, tell me about the Amazon workaholics when Amazon is going to a mega cycle that's going to be, what, 10 hour overnight shifts. And yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, who's, who's got a problem here? <laughs> like, Who changes this? How? You know, like, as, as the dynamics and everything is just moving so fast where who changes this yeah labor but in a day-to-day -day, which is what ultimately we were fighting right it's a it's a day-to-day -day battle i think it's also a matter of an individual saying Hasta acá llegué. this is it this eight hours clocking out bye bye i i think that there are times when we need to do that especially after a year of madness because oh yeah Otherwise, we are in that machine like Charles Chaplin. And yes, disconnecting the workaholism that you mentioned, Elise, it's extremely, you can't. It's like you're on a go roll, on a roll, and you can't disconnect, and you're still thinking and thinking and thinking. It's very difficult. Section five, more speed, four, seven.
trolling. Get back to work. Go on. What must it be like in hospitals? I mean, it was it was it was starting to go crazy already before the pandemic. I can only imagine what it's like now, um, with the, the the with the amount of people who are coming in into the hospitals, and uh, it must be just paralyzing and really detrimental to people's health. Not to mention being exposed to the COVID nineteen virus. Yeah, I, I'm I'm wondering though. You know, this was already happening, and Sarah, you talk about it some in your book. I mean, is are we talking about changing the nature of work? I mean, we've already we were already before the pandemic having this bleeding over because we can work. A, a lot of us can work anywhere. Now we've really found out. We were forced to find out. You know, who can? You know, there are some people who can't. You know, you 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 have to. You have you know the supermarket workers can't zoom in to do their jobs, right? There's certain people who have to actually physically go to work, but it turns out that there are a lot of people who don't and that really blurs the lines. And are we, you know, but also they're handing out money, right? And people have been talking about a universal basic income for years, which was never a serious conversation, but apparently, you know, that can happen. I mean, is, do we have an opportunity to really talk about what work, what work really is, you know, I mean, does even, I mean, Andre, when you're talking about the you know, eight hours, I mean, you know, I, I mean, if I had my brothers, would I, you know, work eight, even eight hours a day? There's a lot of other things I'd like to do with my day. Just saying. Well, yeah. And there are things that we, I've been thinking about this a lot, right? The way that like, there are things that we end up making part of our jobs that if we actually were like taken care of in a way, instead of like trying to monetize all your hobbies, you could just have hobbies. What a concept. I know it's shocking, know. right? But instead of being like, okay, I've got to, I've got to find a way to make like going to the movies my job. So oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go see a movie. And now I feel like I have to write about it, right? This is probably one of the reasons I haven't watched Nomadland yet. It's like, I'll feel like, oh, got to write about it now. Cause it's my job. Um, and it, it sort of sucks the enjoyment out of it. Yes. Yes. And you know, I, I, I'm still mad at Dolly Parton for, for doing the side hustle commercial. Um, uh, Dolly. but you know, wait, wait, um, what, side, what side hustle commercial? Oh, did we miss the Dolly Parton? Dolly Parton rewrote nine to five to be five to nine for the Super Bowl ad for Squarespace to talk about how everybody has a side hustle after their main job. And I was just like, Dolly, no. Um, I know, I know she didn't talk to Jane first, but Jane would have kicked her butt on that. I mean, it did, it, it's bonkers right because like nine to five was based on a worker struggle a movie came out of of the actual organizing of women there's a wonderful documentary about nine to five the organization now too that's streaming on pbs that's um not the last movie i watched but um, i think they extended it all the way through march because it's it's really good and it's like yeah look at that like nine to five what a concept what a shocking idea we could live in how much like we work. last year sarah hmm wasn't that the one that you're talking uh, filmed uh, like a year ago, two years? Yeah, ago? I mean it's it's new. Right? It, I mean it wasn't. Most of it is archival footage and stuff. Right. But yeah, but it's um, years. yeah, it's it's right. streaming on on PBS now. Really good. As secretary, you need to be the best you can be. This group of women whose voice was not being heard. There's something you can do about it. Everything exploded was married to a movement. They built their own kind of feminism, and it was powerful. I'm not just a secretary. I'm a secretary.
um yeah and and like I just oh, Dolly Dolly what are you doing um we don't what need to all have a side hustle I swear we don't but what you're talking about Sarah is is you know, this this you're right I mean you're, everything becomes work and in some ways you know like I play tennis I work very hard at playing tennis but I'm still playing tennis I'm not professional I'm not trying to make a living at it I just have fun with it right mm -hmm. But turning everything into work um, or having to make money for it, um, you know, and it, and it sort of reminds me of the, you know, Uber drivers and, you know, folks like that, you know, who are, you know, sort of chasing this dream. And I mean, any of these folks that you talk to, they're not making a living at it. And I just sort of have this, this horrible dystopian vision. This actually kind of gets us into your movie, you know, Lapsus, of, of this just future with people just bits and bobs of crappy little jobs and it doesn't really add up to anything and, and yeah. maybe it's yeah like it it's right like how do we stop all this I don't know I'm a freelancer like I do bits and bobs of everything it makes it really hard to turn off it makes it really hard to say no to anything it makes it really hard to like not focus constantly on work um because every minute that I'm not working is maybe a minute I'll never get another offer to write something. But silver lining, technology, which has us to, to a degree, to an extent in this position, in this situation, also spreads the word. And I think that for women, it, there are instances in which, it, wow, it's a, the, um, the, the, the speed at which information travels from one point of the world to the other is so quick and so are the passions for movements and for you know advancing um and true story my sister just a few weeks ago was being you know like uh, she had her boss and the conversation wasn't very nice and and she was trying to speak right and the guy started speaking over her she pulled the Kamala Harris all the way in Panama you know like and it was efficient, right? And then and, and people's the meeting stood up to her. But what I'm saying is, you know, that same technology that puts us in this situation also gives us like examples of how to be, how to handle things. And by that by that standards, I think it's quite brilliant that we can learn. You know, hey, quiet, I'm speaking. You know, all the way in Panama, and then I think she said it in Spanish. You know, but but the message was there and clear nicely <laughs> okay. yeah i guess it's just harder when you're not kamala harris to tell people to sit down and shut up oh yeah no but i'm like you know like yeah, yeah. I, I you you can say like i mean this is the same thing with like sheryl sandberg and lean in right it's like okay this is great advice if you're already the executive right but right. like when you're the person at the ground floor if you tell your boss to you know eat it because you need pregnancy leave like they're just gonna fire you so yeah, I feel like, you know, I don't, I don't need examples of telling people to shut up. What I need is not to be penalized for it. Right. I know how to do it, you know, <laughs> but like, gotcha. you know, I sit around worrying that if I say something too mouthy on Twitter, that I'll, that'll be the end of, of writing for a certain publication. Gotcha. You know, because so it's, it's just like everything is a possible reason that you could get, you know, have work consequences. <laughs> And yeah, like, I, I just don't think it's like individual women's fault that there's still a gender pay gap because we, you know, and studies show that like, if we negotiate like men, we don't get the job because we're seen as a pain in the ass. And like, you know, I am a pain. My, the part of the problem is my job is to be a pain in people's ass, right? I'm a journalist. My job is to like call up people and ask them for comment when they don't want to give me a comment. Right. Um, but like the same thing that they teach you how to do and be sort of relentless about when you're doing the job, you get punished for when you're trying to get work. So we're, 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 we're well, time to wrap up here, sisters. So I just want to check in with you real quick. Uh, each of you would tell you a few words about the films you're going to do Q&A for. You're going to do question and answers for. So Andrea, you want to start first? Yo ando buscando a mi hijo. La última vez que lo vi fue hace dos meses. 
Mi hijo desapareció cuando tomó un camión que iba para la frontera. Indícame si reconoce algo. Yo sé el empaque. Le digo que a mi hijo lo asaltaron. No ande preguntando esas cosas en público. No sabe quién la puede escuchar. You have been found guilty of improper entry into the United States of America. You're now in removal procedures. ¿Cuánto hace que las cosas están así? Tanto con cuidado, carnal. Por aquí la cosa está bien caliente. Oiga, no le voy a hacer nada. ¿De espaldas te pareces a él? Todos nos parecemos de espaldas. Mi mamá quería que me fuera. Casi nunca le mandé nada. Las cosas no andan como para estar hablando con desconocidos. Levántese. Tenemos que irnos. No voy a volver hasta encontrar. Aquí se está perdiendo mucha gente. Algunos en el cruce y otros cuando los regresan. Es que mi hijo puede estar muerto. Pero yo tengo que saber. Si usted sabe algo, dígame. A few words about this film. I'm... I think that one of my biggest, one of the, one of my biggest takeaways of, of having watched the trailer and read a little bit about the, and, and read about the movie is the fact that we, we know what immigrants are going uh, through. We know the plight and uh, timely as well. Uh, president spoke yesterday about kids being held uh, in the border. Um, but what I love about it, it it's that, It's not the statistics that we see in this movie. It's not the, the angle of, of the immigration problem itself, but we see it through the eyes of mom. I think that's huge, you know, because she created that life, right? And that life is in danger. It's like her own life is, or worse, you know? It's, a, it's like her own soul and all of her, the future of her soul and all her next lives. That's what's at stake. And I think that, That that feeling as a mother to me, it, it's it's huge. I, I can feel uh, uh, Magdalena's pain, and 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 I'm really looking forward to this movie. Thank you, sis. Sarah. They have chosen to abuse us, to leave us behind and out here injured while their CEOs and shareholders get rich on our backs. They don't care about us. But guess what? They're not out here. Out here, it's just us. And we've got each other. And today, we finally have a way to force them to stop and listen. Yeah, so I'm doing the Q&A for Lapsus, which is a fictional future or present or something movie that I have not seen yet, so I can't say that much about it, other than that um, we don't get that many movies about work, but maybe that's starting to change with Sorry to Bother You and now this, um, that we are actually going to see, like we were saying before, like the workplace as a site of interesting storytelling again because it's certainly where like so many of us spend so much of our lives well, thank you both for being part of the uh the film fest it's uh like as you both i think spoke to really eloquently um i always look forward to the film fest i work on it for months and then you know when people show up and sarah maybe it's like when you do a book event or andrea when you do a you know organize an event and you know all to have all the people show up it's just it's such such a wonderful feeling and to you know it, having a bunch of people on zoom watching a film is better than nothing but uh <laughs> it's, 
it's, it's not the same, but I'm really looking forward to, uh, to seeing uh, the, these films with you and I appreciate you being part of the film fest. And I think uh, at least you're gonna do our, our official wrap up here, right? Yeah, thank you very much, sisters. It was a great conversation. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to both films and I'm looking forward to reading your book too, Sarah. Uh, it, it's right, right up my alley. You know, I'm Coalition Labor Union Women and we are talking about what's happening to women and work and the impact of this pandemic. So uh, thank you all, and thank you for being part of DC Labor Fest, and you know, giving of your time. I know, I know you got other things to do, even though you can't leave your house. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and we'll see you next time. And enjoy. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good weekend. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.